Joey, we were, we're talking to Dave Sook today and the conversation came up as he has done, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars in different types of syndications. How do you pick a great operator, right? Because operator is going to make or break any deal. And it reminds me to you and I and a couple others went out on a due diligence trip back in, what was that, 2016, 2017? I think it was 2017, yeah. And there was three different companies that we were doing due diligence on to determine whether or not we wanted to personally invest and to, um, you know, have as resources for, for friends and family. One trip was to Dallas and I went out there and I introduced, you know, got to spend a day with this group, got to see their offices, talk with their team. Um, a couple of the members on the team were attorneys. The other ones had been in very high level executive jobs, companies that I actually respected. And I was like, man, this group is solid. I really like this. It's something I want to do. The next trip, if you remember, is when you, me, and two others went out to Arizona and we got right. to meet with some people. What what did you feel like that looked like? How how, how did you feel like that team um, fit the well, bill? So, so first I thought they, they really knew their stuff. And when we went and met with them, they explained how the GPLP partnership worked. They, they were very detailed and, you know, had a, had a decent track record. Now looking back on it, I wish I would have asked more questions pertaining to track record. Like what have they done in the multifamily space specifically? Cause that's what we were talking to them about investing in. And if you'll remember, they showed us one of their projects and it was a single family home that they were flipping. And I, I just now looking back on it, I think, why would we go and look at a single family flip if their business is multifamily syndications? It only it reveals to me now I should have been asking the question, you know, if you knew how to do this really well on the multifamily side, you probably aren't spending your time doing single family flips. And so they're probably too soon to invest with. That's my take. Hey, and by the way, you're asking, why is this important for me to be listening to? And why is this important right now before this podcast? Here's the key is that the team, the people, as you will hear Dave Zook reference, is the most important part of investing through syndications. You have to know the team. You have to have a great team. They have to have a track record. You want to be getting information from other people talking about how great their track record is before you even go and do your own due diligence, right? Not that that's right. Not that all of that is perfect and is flawless, but it helps. And it absolutely rings true, Joey, when we think about the third group. Yes. We fly out to Los Angeles, California. And we get in a car and we drive north for about 45 minutes. And that was about six miles. No, that's, <laughs> yeah, anywhere in LA seems like that. No, I think we actually drove like 30 miles out of town. Probably took us an hour and a half. But we, we go and we meet with the team of this other group that I won't mention. But I, I just want to get your take of what was your first reaction of the team that we met when we were there? Uh, they were, they were not organized. They were not um, even like, it was almost like they weren't even expecting us. It was kind of right. like we showed up, we're banging on a door and, you know, we're in, in it, at a call center. And so they, they're not looking for us. They they don't know who we're even trying to meet with. So we're like trying to text the guy and call him and trying to figure out where the meeting is even supposed to be held. And again, they're just kind of coming in very casual. Like one guy comes in like he was just on the on the mountains earlier no, taking a hike and then came in. and Remember, he had just gotten back from like a dentist appointment. So he's in shorts and like a tank top or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm thinking he came off the mountain or whatever. But yeah, it was totally a different experience. And shocker, it, that investment didn't work out so well. Well, but if you went to the the meeting through the due diligence process saying, Hey, the most important thing for us is to grade the team, not the deal, right? We're going to start with the team because the team is the most important part here. These are the guys who are acts. Cause these are both 
the, the groups we would be investing with, but they would also be operating the deals. And so right. it was like, okay, we're going to invest in the team. How would we grade the team? And if the team didn't meet, you know, a B plus, A minus rating at minimum, we, we don't even look at them. That's right. The group in California, what rating, if you were just grading the team, not the deal, because we all got excited about the deal, but if you had just graded the team, what would you have graded them? D minus. <laughs> at best. Yes. And, and, and man, would that have saved us some headaches? Man, would that have saved us some money, right? Because we invested and made, had some real big losses there. And I think back now to knowing what I would do now as I make investments, I invest in the team, not the deal, not the numbers on the paper, the operators in the deal. And so as you listen to Dave Zook, one of the best um, people to, to be asking this question of, of how do you determine the syndications and the projects you're going to get involved in, he says, you got to look at the team. So Joey, let's don't take any more away from this interview right now. Let's jump in with Dave Zook. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Wealth Without Wall Street Tribe, be prepared to get your mind blown today. We have our good friend Dave Zook back in the house for a second episode. Dave, thanks for being here. Hey, Joey, Russ, thanks for having me back on. It's been a while. We were together in the spring in person, and uh, live and in person at one of your events, but I'm looking forward to be back on your show. It's always fun to learn from somebody, Joey, who thinks outside of the box. And as we know about you, Dave, you emulate that um, to the highest level. The last time we were together, we were in Austin, Texas, and you were talking about, hey, there's things that you want to do anyway. Set your brain to work in the subconscious so you can not only enjoy assets, but also acquire them so that they can create cash flow. So if it's all right, I'd love to make our conversation today around that and just, you know, maybe kind of talk a little bit about some of the things that you've been able to do in the past as far as buying assets that you've also got to enjoy personally, but be able to write off. Is that cool? Yeah, that's perfect. So I believe it's it's easier to build wealth and to live tax efficiently today than it's been in most of human history. And, you know, you, you have uh, technologies that are now available to you that they could only dreamed of. Our parents and grandparents could only dreamed of. And so, you know, you, you now have the, uh, you know, technology built around short term rentals that allows you to to own assets that, you know, a decade or two ago, those assets would have been a real hole in your wallet and would have been a liability. Well, now you can take that asset and you can get some use and enjoyment out of it. Um, but, you know, you can also make that cash flow and you can make that asset, you know, work for you. And so we've we've collected one of the things I've, I've learned um, from my good friend Tika Tawari. He told me, you know, the real inflation that we're seeing today is 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 happening in rare desirable assets for you you know the uh, not inflation but the way you uh, preserve your wealth like when you see inflation and and how to protect yourself against inflation you you want to be buying those rare desirable assets to protect you from that inflation because that's where you've seen you know properties rare desirable assets properties you know waterfront lakefront riverfront ocean mountain you know whatever um if they're in a rare desirable uh if they're a rare desirable asset in a really good location that thing is going to appreciate so when you look back over the last you know a couple years especially and you think about okay think about a rare desirable asset whether it was a rolex watch or a, a a desirable piece of real estate what which one of those assets haven't appreciated by 50 80 
hundred percent over the last five years. And so, you know, being able to take advantage of technology and, and the rental programs that, that are now available to us, it, it, it makes it, it gets you options to the point where you, you didn't have those options five, 10, 15 years ago. No, I mean, you really don't. And like you said, I mean, one, you're creating a huge wound uh, and opening it up in my in my belly right now, Dave. So one of those desirable assets is a lakefront property that I used to own that I sold in 2020 like a moron. As you might have realized, I, I gave up about 55 to 60 percent appreciation in it. And even worse, I gave up access to it. Right. Like, yeah. Had I been using the, this brain that God gave me, I would have kept it. I would have rented it. I would have cash flowed it. I'd been able to utilize it. And I'd have probably another 750000 or if not more in my pocket in equity if I wanted to tap that to be able to do other things. Well, and and this isn't because I'm a genius of some sort. This is this is more luck than anything. Uh I got a story that's that's just opposite of that one. We bought our first riverfront house uh, in Maryland um, in the spring of 2020. So you can about imagine what kind of appreciation uh, we had since then. And you know, of course, it, it when you, it, hindsight is always like, well, of course you would have. I mean, we've you know we've we've had you know some just some serious appreciation since then. Well, it didn't feel like that then. You know, it, 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 you know, we were looking at that thing. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Is this the right time to be buying something like that? You know, and I always kind of laugh at people who who say, "Well, I'm going to wait to do anything. I'm going to wait to buy stuff. I'm going to wait to buy apartments till the next crash." I'm thinking, "Oh yeah, really?" And you, you know, you you don't have to, you don't have the courage to do it now to buy a good deal now, but you think you will have when, when uh, you know the world falls apart and you can't get financing and you know, so yeah, but no, we got we got a little bit of lucky, we got a little bit lucky with that one, but I have bought some some using that same thought process of of recognizing that to protect yourself from inflation. Um, Buy those rare desirable assets, and they're gonna they're gonna be your inflation hedge. Uh, we picked up some nice properties, and we picked up some some really good waterfront properties in the last uh, in the last couple of years. So so that's that's great. But somebody is listening, saying, "Hey, that's awesome. They're rare and desirable. And how do I break into that? Like, is there creative things I should be thinking about?" to to enter into those spaces like what, what are some ways that you've you've seen that happen yeah so i mean there's a number of different um things that you can do i mean one of them could be owner financing you know getting creative on the front end when you're talking to the seller you know why does he want to sell um what's what's anytime anytime i do a a sizable deal, some kind of a deal like that. I'm always trying to find out what's important to the the seller. And um, so, I, if we got a couple minutes, I'd just share a story. One that we're we're right in the middle of right now. We we're we're buying another waterfront farm in in Eastern Shore, Maryland, and and um, you know, so we you know we were having this conversation with the broker, and I'm trying to find out what's important to the seller, and and of course the seller starts talking to me, and I'm you know taking notes, and I'm like, okay, so how can we you know? So then when I put the offer together, I put the offer together in a way that I already sort of knew what motivated him, and you know, so uh, he was financially motivated. Well, he 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 fell into some hard times, and. I, you know, it wasn't one of those things where I was trying to exploit that, but it, but it was. I, I figured out that cash is important to him because um, the bank had collateralized his farm, and whatever he was going to sell the farm for was basically going to go to the bank. So he wanted cash. Well, you know that I can't just give him a hundred grand cash under the table and for the farm, and then write up some kind of a thing with the farm and you know i had no interest in doing that but i started looking around like how could i make this work for this guy and so he had a a a brand new almost brand new polaris side by side uh, one one of the polaris utvs and 
uh, great hunting vehicle and just a, a really good vehicle. And I said, well, I, I kind of did the math in my head. I was like, okay, that machine's worth, you know, 20 to 25 grand. So I gave him an offer on the farm. I said, look, here's the offer. Um, it's all cash. Um, you know, it, it, not no financing contingencies. Yeah. We're going to get financing, but you know, there's no contingencies whatsoever. Short time, you know, short time to closing or whatever. And I'll give you 50 grand cash for that, for that Polaris UTV, that side by side. So it got him what he wanted and I got what I wanted. We got a great deal. We can get closing done quickly. Um, you know, it just, just, finding a way to, to figure out what the seller wants and, and being willing to get creative and, and get them, get, get them, get them what they want. And, you know, because at the end of the day, if you want to get a great deal done, it's not all about you. You know, right. it's, it's, it's about figuring, you know, it's about two people coming together and both sides women. Well, we, we were recently on a podcast uh, with a good friend of ours, Pace Morby, and he was saying you got to figure out what people's rabbits are, and he's got a story behind that. And what you were you were able to figure out what that guy's rabbit was? It Go was down that needed, hole, right? <laughs> he needed some cash to stuff down that hole, right? And he uh, and you found a way to do it creatively. Uh, good for you. All right, I, I want to kind of pivot a little bit. So as we're we're this podcast is airing here at the beginning of twenty twenty three. And there is a lot of people that are nervous, right? Like the the world is seemingly on on a on an edge, right? And a, a lot of us looking at it may say, "Oh, it's the edge of about to go down a cliff." But others look at it from a different, uh, more optimistic uh, point of view. So I want to kind of pick your brain a little bit. You're obviously getting into lots of different asset classes. What are some of those asset classes that you are evaluating right now and getting into um, and that you think are really prime for the markets that we're in today? Yeah. So as you guys know, going out into to the market today and finding a stabilized asset that delivers great cash flow, it's just, that, that, that's hard. Um, not saying it's not, not saying it's, you can't do it, but I would say the low the low hanging fruit has been picked, and you know this isn't like it was back when I started buying multifamily in 2011, 12, 13, all the way up to late 18. Um, you know, and even self storage. Yeah, I mean, it, it it's hard. You know, to to be able to get value, uh, you got to create it. And so, you know, a couple things. Uh, one is. You know we're very active in the in the self storage space, um, but we're we're buying and then we're forcing value. We're buying an underserved market. We're adding climate controlled units. We're stabilizing that thing back up, and we're selling to REIT. And appetite REIT appetite for self storage has been incredible, and they'll pay a premium for a stabilized asset. That's been a great asset class. It's been a, big, a great business model within that asset class. Um, the other thing is, you know, talking about forcing value, um, we are building car washes and, you know, to where, you know, when you can build a um, tunnel wash, we're, we're, we're building Tommy's Express tunnel car washes. And when you can build a car wash and a very desirable piece of real estate and a main drag in, in town, and you can operate that business. You're forcing value. You're you're taking a uh, an asset that that'll cost you you know six to eight million dollars to to build all in with the land and the building all in. You're talking you know six and a half to eight million dollars. Um, but if you if you put a business inside that building and you really get those numbers cranking and your operations team does what it's supposed to do, uh, you cr- you'll quickly push that that value up to 10 12 15 million and and north of that and when you get really creative and package those up and build a bunch of them package them up and sell them to a private equity firm you you know we're seeing some of those packages trading you know at scale some of those packages that are 20 plus car washes we're seeing some of the trading at a 20x multiple and so you know 
you just you you just can't go out in the marketplace and think, well, you know, this this work back in 2015 to 2019, it'll keep working. Uh, some of the things that worked back then doesn't work anymore. And you're going to go out and create the value on a lot of these assets to really get the value. Um, and so we're, we're seeing some of those opportunities. So, so we made a shift. And, um, but, you know, and then, of course, our, one of our core asset classes, ATMs, and that, that has the um, loss of value in the equipment already built into the business model. So, you know, not much to argue about there because it's going to lose value. It doesn't matter if it's 2000, you know, if it's 2009 or 10 or if it's 2018 or 19, you know, it's going to lose value to seven year deal. And it's, it's, you know, you're going to have loss of value for equipment. So again, it's about a business that you get to build inside that asset class. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. Why? Because you were unprepared. Are you unprepared, though, for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30-second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. So I get the business side, and I love the the way you're, you're thinking about how to, to push value or to increase the value of something because it's always going to have a, an exit opportunity on the back end. What about from a tax standpoint? Because I know you're like the master of not only having the cash flow and appreciation kind of built into most of your models, but also a tax benefit. How does that work in terms of your self storage and your car wash models? I, I know the ATM models we've covered before um, has it kind of built in on the front end with some bonus depreciation and other things, but what about self storage and car washes? Yeah. So, so when you sell at a premium, you know, you're right. I mean, you're, you're setting yourself up for a, a tax liability, but we know, you know, that we, we already, we've been thinking about that long before we've, we've sold that asset. And so we know we're, we, we know where we're going with the money, whether that's a 1031 exchange, whether that's into another asset class where we can use cost segregation studies and bonus depreciation, or where you can, you know, invest in ATM machines where you can take 100% bonus depreciation and wipe out big chunks of, of your capital gain. And we, we know, we, we have a strategy. We, we know what we're doing uh, or where we're going with the money before we even sell. So to us, it's, it doesn't become a tax problem. It becomes, okay, we, 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 it becomes an opportunity to invest in some other asset class and get creative in that asset class and just keep that ball rolling. And, you know, the, the, you know, I've, I've, of course, I've heard it many times. You know, you, you well, if you make a lot of money, you got to pay a lot of tax. It's conventional wisdom, right? Well, the next question, and you know, or the next statement, and it's every bit as uneducated as, well, I know, but it's going to catch up to you sometime, right? Well, no. I mean, the the concept remains the same. The number gets bigger. The zeros, you get more zeros, but it, you know, the concept is the same. You keep playing the game. And you're smart about it and it becomes part of who you are and part of your business plan it's not a problem you just got to know what you're doing dave you have become the go-to person when it when it relates to finding cash flow for your cash right people know they go to the realassetinvestor.com they can take their cash and create cash flow whether that is investing in car washes investing in atms multifamily, stores, facilities, right? The question that I would love for you to talk a little bit about, I know we've had offline conversations about it, is how do you do that so well? How do you manage the responsibility of 
everyone else's money in such a high level, right? Because there's a lot of due diligence that has to be done on projects that creates a lot of pressure. I'm just really interested in how you're able to handle that and handle that so well. So, you know, it, it, it becomes, to me, um, number one, I, I got to like the asset class. But then after I'm convinced that the asset class will do with it, it will do for us what we want it to do for us. Now it becomes a whole lot. It, now, now the asset class all, almost becomes like an afterthought. It's like, okay, we like the asset class. It'll deliver us whatever it is we're looking for. Is it cash flow? Is it tax benefits? Is it appreciation? Whatever. Most of the time it's a combination of cash flow and tax benefits. So once you, once you like the asset class, now that thing becomes almost like an op, uh, like a like a like a secondary uh, issue, and, and and now you start thinking about okay, team, because at the end of the at the end of the day, this is a people business, and you're only going to be as good as your team. So so I actually spend more time uh, making sure, like on the front end, I spend more time vetting the team than I do the actual asset because if i got a really good team they're going to find good assets right and they're going to make them perform and so we like to surround ourselves with really good operators and 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 then in terms of the responsibility of of raising capital and managing other people's money and and all that and it, and it's a huge responsibility but we found ways to um mitigate the risk or reduce the risk for our investors. And I'll give you an example of that. So when we first got into the car wash space, I've been in the car wash space going on three years now, but when, when we first got into the space, um, you know, we're, we're all familiar with the typical syndication model. A lot of times you'll see 70, 30 split, 70% of the cash flow going to the investor, 30% to the sponsor, and maybe you hit a certain IRR threshold and it goes 50-50, whatever. Maybe it's a 60-40 split on the equity side, whatever. But one of the things that I started talking with my partner about when we got into the car wash space is like, okay, we really like this asset class. And we really like it for a lot of reasons. We like it for, for cash flow. We like it for the tax uh, benefits and you know how aggressive it is. In fact, one of the things that's unique about a car wash, it, it's it's actually be, it's unique with a car wash and a gas station is you can take the building and you can write that building off just like it's a piece of equipment. And so very aggressive on the on the tax benefit side as well. But one of the things we were looking at, I, I was I was trying to figure out, okay. Let's figure out how we can reduce the risk for our investors in this one. Because at the end of the day, you got a new asset class for us, you got a new operations team for us, um, and you got development risk. Those are all real potential risks. And so I said, okay, we I've got enough of cash flow coming from other sources. I I can be patient. Why not give the investors a hundred percent of the cash flow? get them to the point where they get all the money, you know, until they get uh, 1.75 times their money. Meaning if you invest a hundred thousand dollars, you get 175 back. We project that's going to be in five years or less. Um, and we get paid when, and when they get to their 1.75 X, they exit the deal. You know, it's strictly cash flow and tax benefit for them. No equity. So, we put that program together. Uh, it works for us. Um, of course, I'm covering the uh, the management fees. I'm covering the setup costs, the admin, and all that to run the fund and whatever. And it's coming out of pocket. Uh, it's okay. Um, but I'm willing to wait to the back end after my investors get the cash. Now that may not work for everybody. Some of the some of the investors may think, well, yeah, but I want I want um, I want to be a you know I want to be an equity investor. Great. We have, we have equity positions available in our self storage fund, whatever. So, you know, there, there's different ways that you can set up the fund, but that was one way that we got creative and tried to, you know, come together and say, how can we reduce the risk for our investors? Give them a piece of, you know, give them really good cash flow. Uh, let them be a part of, like, you know, we're we're really building this portfolio to exit to some private equity firm. 
We've seen the multiples and we're building this business to where we'd never want to sell it, but to where we'd be crazy not to. And so, you know, a way that an investor can be a part of that upside is, let's say we get bought out in three and a half years. Well, now you're 1.75x, you know, it's not going to take you five years to get there. It's going to take three and a half. Then your IRR goes through the roof. But th well, that's just an example of how we how we learn how to reduce some risk for our investors. Well, I try to hear, hear me say this. Like I, I, I like Dave so much because we've gotten to spend a lot of time with him personally. And Dave, what you're talking about, which we've interviewed a lot of syndicators on our show over the time, have we, Joey? And, and there, there's a lot of really good people out there. But what I really like about you, Dave, is that you think like an investor because you are an investor, right? Like this isn't just a job. Like there's a lot of people out there that just raise money for the benefit of making money, right? It is just another way that they're trading time for money. But you're doing this as an investor. You're thinking like an investor. You're finding ways to get your own dollars at work. And it just coincides that then you find ways to do it at scale to allow other people to come alongside. What I, I want to ask though, really quickly, you said a second ago, something about an operator and finding a good team. I'm really interested. What makes a good operator? So this, okay. So normally I would say track record. Um, I would say, you know, I, I'm looking for things like, okay, how did your portfolio perform, um, you know, coming out of 2007, 8, 9, 10? What did it look like back then? How long were you in the business? Show me some of your deals. And and really, at the end of the day, I'm much more interested in in first in talking to a bunch of their investors. I'm much more interested in in what their investors are saying about them than they than what they're saying about them. So that's that's normally where it starts, where I start hearing a name from investors like, oh man, we really like, really like these guys. And then you sort of sort of, you know, somebody makes that introduction, you sort of get to know these guys, start having conversations. But in the in the case for our car wash operations team, they didn't have years of experience. They they had some experience, but not a lot, and certainly not to scale. We helped mitigate some of that risk by one of the uh, head guys that Tommy's Express is also on our GP team. Um, that helps. Um, in fact, you know, you guys heard about our our investor tour down to San Antonio, where we where we toured through um, our San Antonio location. That opportunity came through that relationship with the guy on our GP team. We would never, we probably would have never seen that deal, but he's he's able to see kind of both sides of the of the of the counter, and uh, so just being able to do some of those things strategically and take advantage of those opportunities, help to kind of mitigate that risk of a new operator. Gotcha. So let me ask you this. The, you're obviously bullish on car washes. You've got a, a really strong business plan and you can see the future on that. Is there anything that you're vetting right now? It doesn't mean that you're investing in it yet, but you see like the future coming to us that you're like, hey, I'm paying attention to this asset class. Is there anything like that that we can we can learn from? Yeah. So uh, and I'll go back to Russ's point um, before I answer that. I'll go back to Russ's point about, you know, when you said that I am the investor and it's sort of just, you know, I, I, I look at it like what I'm doing for my investors. And this may sound selfish and it probably is, but it, it starts with me like. I have a tax problem. I'm building cash flow streams. I'm building equity. I'm building my wealth. And now, you know, can I share that? Is this business model something that I can grow and scale? But it really started, this whole, this whole investment syndication thing really started out of a $500,000 a year tax burden that I had. And so I entered through that lens and I'm like, man, I have a need. And I went after it and I bought a couple hundred units of apartment buildings on my own. Then I realized that other people had the same problem that I was having. And it sort of just, I sort of became a syndicator without trying. 
And so it, it, it starts with that. But then, in, in, but then in terms of, of your question, Joey, about, you know, opportunities, when, whenever, whenever there's a big bill gets passed and whether you like the bill or not, whether it's the Patriot Act or it's the CARES Act or whether it's now the Inflation Reduction Act. By the way, then this inflation we were talking about is going to go away because they passed that bill now, so we should all be good and, and you know. Very sure <laughs> right, yeah. I, I feel, I feel but, like going down by the second, to be honest. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, I watch bills like that, you know, and, and, and as toxic as most of them are, and they are, um, there's always opportunity inside of the bills. And so one of my questions to my CPA was, Hey, could you give me a summary of what's in that bill and you know, what the, where the opportunities are? So he gave me like an eight page summary out of the 400 page bill and whatever. And then I said, well, okay, you got to break it down for me even further. And now let's talk about the summary and let's talk about, okay, where, where's the opportunities, where can we make money in this thing? Where, what we can, what can we uh, do to make this thing work in our favor? You can only you can you can look at it like that, or you can play the victim, right? So we had this conversation about okay, renewable energy, um, nuclear energy, uh, solar, when you know the the electric vehicle uh, components or or minerals or you know stuff that's needed there, infrastructure, maybe charging station. You know, wh- where's the opportunity here? So it's interesting. Um, we've we've acquired um almost 30,000 acres uh different parcels large parcels of real estate and um took really took advantage of the high timber prices over the last two years and have really done well with that but a couple of those opportunities on these large pieces of real estate uh have been solar and so we were talking to large solar companies about doing institutional grade uh institutional size solar development on our properties you know we had the transmission lines uh, running through the property and so the infrastructure was there we just needed a contract and so we were having these conversations and um one of them had a contract drawn up and and then they were like well you know their conversation to us was like well this is probably going to be a 25 2025 2026 thing and so the weekend that I had my investor party at our house and we're sitting around the big old campfire and it's like two o'clock in the morning and, and there's still, you know, a dozen or two guys sitting around the fire and we're talking about this tax thing uh, with my CPA right there in the group. And, and he was like, well, here's the opportunities. Well, and it included solar and the energy and all that stuff. Well, Monday morning when I get to the office, all of a sudden I had an email saying that, yup, we're ready to go. This thing's green lighted. And this is only a couple of weeks after the Inflation Reduction Act got passed. You know, all of a sudden these things are green lighted. We now have four big institutional sized solar projects under contract, uh, cash in hand for three of them. You know, it, but it's it, it's sort of what you can like when you can get in front of something, when you can get in front of that front of that wave, when you see it coming, you can position yourself in front of that wave and take it. So those are some of the things that I'm looking at. Natural gas, I'm a big fan of natural gas, had a fund for natural gas in the last two years. I personally have been investing in natural gas for the last four or five. Um, I was a year or two early. It didn't feel like a bull market when I first started investing. It was nasty. But some of those positions, some of those uh, you know, personal positions that I that I built from four or five years ago, I mean, we're making like 10, 11 percent returns on those on the per month. And, uh, you know, so, you know, some of those things, you know, when you see those opportunities, um, we're always looking to exploit that we're always looking not not really exploit, but we're always looking for opportunities. I mean, natural gas was a horrible market to be in for the last 10 years. And I knew that. And I knew it was going to come around. I saw them build out the infrastructure at places like Lake Charles and, you know, export terminals and all that. And I knew it was coming. I was just a year or two early. So, Dave, that is that's really awesome to, to be thinking about looking at those acts and these um, these various bills that are passed as opportunities. I I usually cringe whenever those come through. And maybe that is 
my own naivety. I need to be looking at it from an opportunity standpoint. One thing before we we oh, head believe out. me, believe me, Joey, I'm no fan. <laughs> Those things are toxic, but but yeah. there's no reason we should benefit from it, right? So yeah. I love I love what you're how you think from that angle. The last thing I wanted to ask you is something you shared at our mastermind in Austin. For those who may not even be accredited investors, how they could take advantage of um, what you guys have done with these modular homes in the short-term rental space. And if you could break that down as far as why that's a benefit and how people are using that to create their own passive income uh, opportunities, I'd love to, to share that with our audience. Yeah, so our family business is a modular building business. And so that's what I grew up in. Um, I'll tell you an interesting story about short-term rentals. And I'm a, I'm a big short-term rental fan. I own short-term rentals in seven or eight states now. Um, but one of the things I, that, I, that I thought was really interesting, one of, one of our farms that we own here in south-central Pennsylvania, we have a big cabin that probably sleeps 20, 25 people and it's on 300 acres of property. The, the replacement cost on the cabin is probably, I don't know, whatever, eight, eight or 900 grand. That thing consistently delivers us, you know, probably on average throughout the year, probably gets us around $7,000 net cash flow per month. Not, not bad. Um, then on the other end of the farm, on the same 300 acres, on the other end of the farm, we have a park model and we got a little creative with the park model. We, we, we wanted to call it a tree house. So we jacked it up in the air 10 feet, put it up on poles and we put a nice deck out the front. We got a hot tub out there and you got a nice, really nice view of the valley. It's, it's beautiful. But our all in cost for that thing was around a hundred grand. And so we set this thing up, put it on Airbnb. We've been renting it nonstop. I mean, there's you know, pretty much every weekend the things rented out. So, what I thought was really interesting, though, was we're netting about $4,000 per month net income from a $100,000 investment instead of $7,000 a month from an eight or $900,000 investment. So, you know, if, if you get a little creative and you, and you put some unique, you know, the, 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 the hottest thing in, in Airbnb short-term rentals is, you know, unique stays, right? So if you if you start thinking outside the box a little bit and you make your stay unique, um, it can really do well for you. And you really don't have, you know, for, for those of your non-accredited audience or the guys that are looking to start out, anybody can do this stuff. You don't have to be a multimillionaire to do this stuff. You just got to be creative and think, and think outside the box. All right. I love that. Love that. Dave, thank you so much for coming on. We're so grateful to have you as a friend, but also just as a contributor to our community. If somebody wanted to connect with you and find out more about what you're up to, where would you have them go? So the best service you'll possibly get, this, this uh, connects you to every one of my team members is info at therealassetinvestor.com. And if you ask for anything, whether, you know, it's a question about whatever, or you want information on one of our asset classes, somebody on the team will get back to you. Cool. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And thank you for listening to this episode. This is one of those where you kind of get behind the scenes with one of the top syndicators in the nation. A man, as you heard it, is an investor first. Think selfishly, which I love that, right? Because when you're <laughs> thinking selfishly, you're figuring out ways to help other people. There's lots of um, benefit in that. And I hope that you'll think selfishly and to say, hey, how can I be an investor and get other people involved with me? And maybe you'll share this podcast with them along the way. Dave, have an amazing day. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks for having me on your show. Um, I love it. Go out and continue to make a difference in the or make an impact in the investment community. Thanks to you guys. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.